reached in the vets the day before and it was rough and hard. And I remember we came off the start and I hit a wave. I thought, I've hit a blade. It felt, it was so Smart. solid. It felt like a blade clash. And I was like, oh, well, I didn't realize it was that close. And of course it wasn't. It was just a wave. And, you, you know, how much does that slow the boat down? Because we know the water's fast, but actually whacking a something that feels like it's solid, it mm. can't can't help, can it? So it it's a judgment call. That's why we love that race. We can we're going to be talking about that for years. Hey, what is up? Welcome to Last Show Counts. Today's guest is an Olympic bronze medalist, an MBE, and the current boat race umpire. Please welcome Sarah Winkless to the podcast. Thank you very much. Lovely to be here. Oh, thanks for coming. This is a uh, like exciting one, certainly for me. I we've talked before about sort of oh four oh five was when the rowing bug bit me. So you were sort of right up there as one of those people. So that's really cool to kind of be now full circle talking to to people like you and especially what you've done in sport since as well your involvement and stuff there's so much to talk about um pre- predominantly today obviously with the boat race in sort of 10 11 days something like that now um so that's something we're, we're going to talk about for sure um but yeah we, we can get into all sorts and maybe not completely the sort of backstory but um we could save that for another time i'd love yeah. to love to see where we get with that as well yeah, and 405 absolutely. was definitely when the rowing bug. It felt for me that all that work that we'd put in and we started to get results, you know, the same DNA, the same cells, but we'd pushed so hard to get our results over the line. And it was yeah. really, really exciting. So I'm delighted that you were watching. Yeah. Yeah. Tom, yeah, yeah. Tom and I were talking about your career a little bit before we started and then just the progression that you've had, especially from like your first senior world championships to, to, it's sort of the uh, even even oh eight like that's that's just been great you know it just it's a testament to resilience and just pushing hard and improving and just always always striving for more which is exactly what we like to see and hear on this podcast too yeah and wouldn't it be lovely if you went to your first world championships and had the best day at the office but we did not that year so i had a lot of learning to do a lot of humility a lot of improvement um late starter as well you, you learn at university Yep. Well, yeah, I, I, I did international other sports first. Oh, so okay. I was busy throwing discus. Yeah. I did that just about internationally. I played netball, played basketball. So I was national netball champion with my school. Oh, that wow. was amazing. Yeah. At Tiffins. And then I went to Millfield and we came second and third in that. But my dad and my stepdad, um, were rowers. Yeah. So my, both members of Leander where we're sitting here today. Yeah. And you know what it's like as a teenager. You just don't want to do what your parents yeah, do. Yeah. And I was that teenager. And actually dad was amazing. He took me to athletics meetings. He supported me in my disc of throwing. Um, but I think he was quietly delighted when I finally picked up an oar. Was that with your college? It was with yeah. my college. It was Amazing. with my college. Rich. Fitzwilliam College, Cambridge. And basically I got bribed in the bar. This is not a good story. You shouldn't <laughs> drink for boat races. But, but I did drink a few too many and I got bribed to go down rowing and I came down the first time and I just couldn't do it. This sport that I turned my nose up because it looked too boring, looked too easy. Yeah. You're both looking at me going, it's no, neither no, boring no, nor know. easy. But at, when you're, when you're looking at it from the outside, when yeah. you're a child, you're taken to rowing events. Oh, yeah. And when you watch your parents coaching, you, you think, well, what is that all about? You know, I want to do something different. And then I tried to do it and it's really difficult and it's really difficult to get right. And yeah. so I was really not very good at first, um, but that actually got quite liked. And I got better quickly from a really low level. And that was really exciting when I was already at a high level in a couple of other sports. So actually to use my ability to train, to, to be coached, to learn and improve quickly was really exciting. Yeah, I think people come into the sport later um a lot of a lot of what you've need they've they've learned in other sports um and they brought and i guess everyone in rowing comes a bit later because n- almost no one really starts before they're 14 even yeah. if they start so like it's interesting always to ask people like what was the other sport you're into before rowing? what got like side mm. sidelined as soon as the the rowing bug took the bug over happened sport or music we've seen you know kath bishop who was one of the um she was my contemporary she was a bit ahead of me so yeah. she was like a hero She'd been a grade eight pianist, you know, she was nearly wow. a concert pianist, didn't like sport at all, but had learned all those skills in, in, um, music that she then 
took into rowing. It's funny how pretty much all rowers just fall into the sport. Like they weren't expecting to do it right from the start, like thinking that, oh, maybe that's not something for me. I bet you were bribed after all. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I bet you were excited that you got bribed it into the sport after all. And then like how that's obviously turned out for you. Yeah, I have to thank Mikey Roberts often. He was the boat club captain for Fitz at the time. And I think it was his plot that made me do that. So yeah, really, really good. And interestingly, after this, I've got, I'm going over the road to a trustees meeting for Henley Royal Getter Charitable Trust. And we're talking about people falling into rowing and we're trying to bring rowing to people who wouldn't naturally mm. fall into rowing. So an underserved group. And mm. that's really underserved young people and giving them opportunities to to fall into rowing as well which we know is making a massive difference to their lives so it's really exciting absolutely i mean just the sheer amount of um, skills and discipline and everything that you learn just from being around all these highly motivated and driven people i was speaking to someone the other day it's just the level of maturity that athletes get when they've been through rowing where you had to like face everything that you've overcame and the struggles and just look back and do an accountability report and all those things is invaluable and it definitely carries into the the rest of their life so if we can bring that to more people that that'll be that'll be epic yeah yeah i remember a school tutor or a few of our school tutors always said oh i never worry about rowers you know, <laughs> whenever i found out i've got you know i'm looking after some kid who's rowing like he's he's going to be so busy he's going to have to work his own timetable up. i might, won't have to worry about him um and we're also trying to trying to speak to Kath Bishop about love rowing as well, but she's a busy woman. So we're trying to hopefully set that up. But that's obviously also something we're sort of interested in. Well, interestingly, about. she's going to be racing a little bit after me, with umpiring, and um, because she's racing in the vet um, boat race this year. So yeah. I happen to know that. So you want to find her, go down to Putney next Friday. She might be a bit busy. She I- might be busy, but then she won't be. Yeah, and then a bit tired. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, probably Lebby's going to be there as well. Lebby, uh, we've uh, spoken to her about her Atlantic adventure a few months ago. Phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely insane. <laughs> I love how she started the she started the podcast by saying sort of saying like, oh, it was ro- it was really quite an uneventful journey, and then <laughs> proceeds to tell us about all these h- incredible things that happen along the way. Yeah, I think uh, we were talking about it before. Um, one sort of toxic trait of, of high achievers is they like, constantly will will say that they've done nothing or achieved nothing or, or will try and put themselves down. Um, I think that's just maybe part of what keeps you pushing is never too much sort of allowing the to get ahead of yourself. I guess the imposter syndrome in overdrive. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, cool. So, I mean, you mentioned the alumni race. Were you, you were sort of involved in getting that going. I was. Involved in pushing some other people to get it going, uh, yeah, I think, yeah, yeah or, or, or just encouraging those who started it. I think it was really, really important. So the men's alumni race has yeah. been around for ages. It's really served that community well. It's been brilliant to watch them sort of go go through that. And both mm-hmm. my dad and my stepdad actually had be, had been in that. So that was really normal. But I do think it's a real shame that very, very few women uh, find the time to do that kind of thing after sports. So it felt incredibly important to me that when it started to be talked about, that we could um, support it. And I think for for Cambridge, it's been really, really good. There's been some other women in that squad driving it. Absolutely mm-hmm. amazing work by by Pippa Kath and others. Richard Phelps has been out uh, helping coaching. But what also was it's been great is we've got a squad of more than eight. We've been trying to get a, a number of women through that boat and make it inclusive. You know, when it comes to race day, of course, there's a selection piece as there always is. But actually, when we we want people to get out there and and, and row and come back and and have have a play, really. Yeah. And since since finishing your own rowing career, you've had a lot of involvement. So you've been involved with the boat race. You've been a chairman on the BOA Athlete Commission. Been involved in UK anti doping as well. Um, was that a sense of like loving the sport and wanting to stay involved or did you just kind of get roped back in? It was really interesting because <laughs> I, I had a real, my imposter syndrome didn't want to be seen as someone with just lungs and legs. So yeah. I really thought I'd close the door on sport and I thought I was going to business and, you know, support them. I was interested in leadership and coaching. But it's the backbone of my life and yeah. it's what I love. And it's you, you walk into a room and you can find people who have done sport because you hold yourself in a different way. And I feel at home there. So when I started to get an opportunity um, to, co- to go back in, I kind of thought, 
I should try. And actually with the BOA's Athletes Commission, that was the sort of first piece. And I cannot tell you how badly that interview went. I got, I, I, I basically, they had some, I was doing lots of volunteering and I needed to earn some money because yeah. as much as the lottery funding is amazing, you need to earn money when you go finish retiring. And I had decided to do three things, earning, learning, making a difference. And I said I was trying to do all of that out of sports. And what was amazing was I was doing loads of making a difference and loads of learning and very little earning. Yeah. So I knew that if I was going to take something on in sport, I couldn't do it without there being um, some payment attached. So I talked to the BOA and I understood and, and I sort of said, look, um, I think I might go for the chair role. Do you think that's possible? And one person went, why not? That would be amazing. And the other person laughed at me and said, well, we're looking for someone with a slightly shinier medal, which was fine. That was their opinion. Right, so, I was going to say, you'd say that to an athlete. Does that not just light a fire? Like, right, I'll show you. Well, I could understand what she wanted and what they thought they needed. The poster person. The poster yeah, person. Yeah. yeah, and somebody who had credibility with the athletes and you know, role model, all of that. So that, that was fine. But I, I can't, well, one, 50% of the people I spoke to said, have a go. So yeah. you've got nothing to lose. The yeah. interview was dreadful. I cannot tell you, I had to do a presentation and it was my first ever interview and you've got a panel of people here. I forgot the ability to think or speak. <laughs> Tried to get this presentation, which felt, I mean, I think it was maybe eight minutes and it felt like a million finished and then I just looked up at the people I went oh thank you that's over I'm so sorry that was so bad I'm back in the room and just answered a couple of questions that they gave me and you know you think you're never ever ever going to get that role and it was so bad that I, the night that I got the phone call from the guy from the BOA I didn't take my hand out of the washing up bowl because genuinely I thought this is the pity call thank you for trying today you were really bad at the presentation you didn't put your thoughts clearly together sorry and actually, you said, Sarah, look, your presentation today was, but wasn't great. We'll give you that. <laughs> but actually, when you came back in the room, you said some really interesting things. And we think we might want to offer you the role. I was just like, excuse me, what? And it was amazing. So I'm utterly grateful again to Andy Hunt for giving me that chance. I got the role. I was able to build the Athletes Commission. I think he and they saw somebody despite the shine, not so shiny and rather, I'm collaborative, I'm interested in developing people mm -hmm. and I want to hear the different voices um, mm -hmm. in a system. And so that's what they needed. We often talk about with Tom that you don't learn a whole lot just from trying and being at the top. You have to learn so much more when like the path to success hasn't been quite so linear. So actually... I totally, totally understand that the challenge was probably better suited for, for somebody like you. And who cares about what color the medal is? <laughs> it's what's in your head. What's your passion like for the sport? Are you actually going to help the people that you're trying to develop and stuff? So what was it like being in charge? Was it daunting or did you enjoy that experience? Well, it was madness because it was coming into London 2012. I was on the BOA board as well as chairing the Athletes Commission and it felt omnipresent. It was meant to be one day a week, um, but it just felt omnipresent. It felt su there was such a big bus budget for London 2012. There was such a big budget deficit at the time when we picked up the projects. And there were 270 different projects that were going on. And I was meant to be getting an athlete viewpoint at the heart of some of these. So I was lucky enough again that I could work well with the, the people within Team GB and I just went in and I said look which ones have been decided because frankly having a, an athlete rubber stamp on things isn't going to help so let's find the half-baked projects let's look at some stuff the athletes can shape and let's start to start to do that so I took out 270 down to about seven and said okay how do we make a difference in these seven projects first and foremost and then build in the other ones and I think that helped because when I brought people in from the from the from team GB in to talk to the commission they were going right we want this we think that works we love that bit we're, we we were not sure about that and they could then make a difference rather than them having already put something to a fruition effects effectively mm -hmm. and then the athletes trying to change it at that point it just didn't 
didn't make sense. But it was it was huge. It was daunting. I said yes to everything. I lived on an hour and a half sleep for six weeks, which I thought I was doing really well on. But I've seen photos of myself. <laughs> <laughs> it um, but it was an amazing, amazing time. Do you think we spoke to a lot of other people about um, kind of drawing similarities between sport and business? Do you think you drew on sport at all? I mean, just hearing you talk about that was sort of making me think about watching an eight that's got like 30 things wrong with it and being like, well, we can't do all 30 <laughs> things. So let's pick the three bottlenecks. Like what's going to make the biggest difference first and kind of that kind of like triaging? Yeah, at all. I hadn't thought about that way, but maybe I did. It was just because I'm, I'm quite a simple soul at the end of the day, and it was absolute overwhelm. And I was just like, how can we even start this when there's a whole page that's been there? Let's just start at the first step. And, oh, yeah. and that kind of gave the athletes confidence. It gave the organization confidence. And then we were, were able to build from there. Awesome. Sounds really, really, yeah, daunting, but exciting. <laughs> and I think great advice for anyone who's trying something that maybe feels a bit out of reach. Like, what have you got to lose? Yeah. I guess, yeah. Mm. Also, I love, the, I love the fact that you just went for it and then didn't hit, like, again, use the criticism to, the, to fuel the fire. And that's exactly what we need to see more of, yeah. In terms of being uh, involved with the anti-doping stuff, uh, you spent, you said, about six years working there. Um what what was the sort of day to day that you that you did when preventing anti doping in sport? What are like some some of the things that you guys fought? Yeah, so I was six years um, on the board for UK anti doping as well. So I had a board role there that finished really quite recently, September twenty three. So I'm, I re- desperately miss it um, because it was really really fun being part of it. I also chaired an athletes commission there. So the athletes commission was already set up, but wasn't being used as well as we wanted and I what I wanted is so antidote you've got education and you've got in, intelligence and investigation so two sides of the organization really plus everything that you need to run a business um and so I you know I had a good sense of uh, the um education and what what had worked and we were looking globally at other countries and what could they do and what could we do on the budget get a grant in aid from the um, government to run it. And then the WADA code, essentially, the World Anti-Doping Code, tells you what you need to do as a minimum. And so as a as a board member and athlete commission, again, you're going, right, okay, how do we support this organisation to be really, really good at this? So education, we try to ensure that um, that was done in a way that athletes who are getting education repeatedly was... Um, helpful, different. They were engaged, not being told to it. You have to do the education. So how do you have people sit in and listen? There was loads, loads of learning, um, for people. So we had people who had failed t- drug tests to come and sit on the commission because if I was really strongly around this and, and Bernice Wilson, you can tell, she'll tell her own story, but she was massively powerful to have her come and sit in to that group. Because it's very easy when you consider yourself as a, a clean athlete fighting the cheats mm. that you can put yourself in, a, in on a pedestal or your behavior on a pedestal. Mm. And when you bring someone who has had a lived experience that has caused them to, to, to take drugs that means that they have an anti-doping rule violation and it's like Bernie mm. has two, and you start to understand what goes underneath. So there's decisions or non-decisions in her case. She she was being groomed by a coach. And to do that, you are then in a really different um, context. And I think it really helped both the education and the intelligence investigation um, branches of that organisation to hear from her and, and, and others. Because, of course, I was always sure that in UK anti-doping that when somebody failed a drugs test they became our client they were one of the most person of interest to us and we wanted to understand as much as we possibly could about them so we could learn to support others yeah. not not to do that do you think those violations mostly came down to maleducation rather than malice oh really interesting and we have this debate around the board time and time again because I just joined the board when we decided um, with the whole Russia scandal coming coming in, and oh, we actually yeah. sent UK anti-doping out to Russia to do because because their NADO was um, suspended, and the board just be- literally the board meeting before I arrived, they had um, decided that they would 
go in and support and do some testing in Russia, which was a massive thing for our people and our, our personnel, considering the organization at the time was probably 40 people. And so you're sending a number of them out to do that. But the board at the time, which I think was massively brave, went, how do we best protect the clean athlete in the UK? Mm -hmm. We test outside the UK. Mm. And so to answer your question, is it malice or mistake? It is a really, really hard question to ask. I absolutely believe in people and I often wish it's mistake. Yeah. However, and again, Bernice will tell her story. It was malice of someone else trying to make uh, improve her performance. Yeah. And you, how do you find that statistics? Because everyone who's done it, malice will will use the excuse of mistake anyway. Um, and not not. And we had so one of our the guys on the commission in his PhD, he was looking at the clean athletes. So he got people who self obtain themselves as clean and talked around what keeps them clean. So that was his his research area. Absolutely fascinating. But then you started to meet them and talk to them, he and he can, and what they considered clean. Mm. And some people were, right, the WADA code, that's our rule book, mm. and I'll go up to, I'll do what the WADA code says. Others would be like, I won't take an aspirin because mm. that's cheating. Yeah. And others would be like, well, anything that, you know, I can push. Mm. And so WADA code has in competition, out of competition. Well, you yeah, know, when I'm out of competition, I can take the out, you know, and so, it was really interesting understanding everyone who was going, I'm clean, but their comp definitions are so, so different. Yeah. I've taken part in some of those anti-doping talks. I used to walk around with a big say no to doping t-shirt. That was quite famous. Love for it. Yeah. But what, one of the talks that we were here, we had here at Leander was 100% me. Yeah. yeah. So I love that campaign because it just like really got me like thinking like, ah. I want to attribute all the accomplishments just to my down hard work and dedication like that. I've, and, I've uh, always been through that. Yeah. And we, we, we talk a lot about food first. So making sure as much as possible you can get food first. But that's easy when you've got somewhere like Leander and you've got a chef and food. You've got a cavasham, you know, got a chef and a food. Yeah. <laughs> but I had one of my um, rugby colleagues. He went, well, Sarah. I'm not going to be able to roast a chicken first thing in the morning and put it in my, in my, in my sports kit, wrap it in some foil and then eat it after my training sessions because that is not, that's how much protein I need. And that's not good. So I need supplements. And so he, he was very strong around the use of supplements and um, which of course we, and you can today when we first all said assess the need. So it's a really a need and then assess the risk because they're, is always always a risk with supplements. Yeah, yeah, and then I guess the you know, batch testing and stuff like when uh, when I was in the team, it was um, science and sport. It's quite good. We got a little Lucas Aid for me. We're, we're going to pre put them all. I got Lucas so, Aid poisoning several times. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't, don't say that. <laughs> yeah, cut that. When I yeah, when I first started into coverage, they still had all the Lucas Aid stuff, and we used to kind of nick as, men, as much from as we could. And revolting. Did you find it straight? I definitely don't. Care. But did you find that like those packets that it was just sugar it was just sugar and it never mixed properly yeah. and yeah no science sport was quite good as fun but uh, uh, as well but yeah with the batch testing and stuff and things like that yeah like you said there's there's always everything's a risk i guess it's sort of yeah. mitigating circumstances but um i also like that you that the the opinion you took on of someone who has failed a test because you can very much be like why would anyone do that i wouldn't do that and you're like well no this is you know like no one sets i don't think anyone sets out in sport to be like i'm gonna cheat there's this kind of path that takes yeah. you there. And I guess that the positive test is sort of the the symptom, not the problem. Yeah. So you kind of got to go back and see what's yeah. got you here. And you know, that's interesting. It. And I, I, mean, I remember I got to do all sorts of things because of that role and I chaired tackling dopening sport. And it was at a global conference. And genuinely at the time you're like, oh my God. And all I was like, I was, they're talking, they're talking. Oh my God, who's, what's going on? What's the speaker said? I was trying to summarize the sessions. But there was a really fascinating session that I didn't struggle with summarizing because they were talking around, you know, you pick your sport, but there's an 18 year old athlete and you see something in their kit bag. What do you do? I mean, I guess it depends what you're saying as from a coach or you're, you're another athlete. A, another, another coach, another, an athlete, a parent. Uh, what do you do? That was their question. And. What I mean, for me as an athlete, my worry would be that I am going to, if I end up in a, boat, a world championships with that person and we go and win a medal and then they get tested. And so it's not fair on me or anyone else in that boat. So I feel like I'd want to speak to someone. 
Yeah. But it's difficult because if there was nothing wrong, you could cause us rift mm-hmm. in the crew. And It's interesting, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. The only thing you can do really is ask, ask them questions to, mm-hmm. to sort of like rather than assume that mm-hmm. something that they're doing is wrong, ask them yeah. doing and try and deduce from that information like, oh, have they thought this through? Are they, is there anything you can maybe pick up mm-hmm. off of the energy or something like that? And I, and I love it. And I think it is because I was going, oh, I'll talk to their parents. And they were like, actually, what you should do is phone, um, yeah, WADA or, or UCAD, um, which is really interesting, always with their perspective, because then you're showing a system of, of stuff happening and probably nothing will happen, but your, that information is going up into the, the system and the intelligence and investigation, you know, can start to see systems and patterns. So it's fascinating. And I remember sitting there in this session and I'm chairing and I'm trying to go, neutral face, neutral face. But it was like, oh, cause I don't think at, Without that conversation, I would have done that. And we, in UK Antidoping, again, we only get 3% of our intelligence from people who are actually in the sport. Yeah. And they should know. They, we, they, you know, we know what it's like as athletes when somebody's having a good or bad day at the office. You know, when you see someone who's progressing really quickly and whether you think that's right or wrong. And, and I'm, you know, as a discus thrower, when I was, my junior, we'd, oh, I'd often have people go, oh, I think that person's cheating. There'd be a lot of chat in the changing yeah, rooms. Right. And I always went, well, what's she doing about it? Doing, and at the time, you know, UK didn't exist. So UK sport, I think, man, dealt with any of the testing, but it's a really complex and different. And you're right. There's crew dynamics. Mm. There's team dynamics. It, it, it's fascinating. And this guy was from South Africa and what, all the parents wanted, you know, testing in their kids to make sure they were clean mm. until their k- kids got caught. And then they were like, why are you testing them? And it was that l- dance mm. a- around it. So it's, it's, it's a difficult and complex challenge. Yeah. I remember I've been tested a few times as well. I mean, sometimes they just turn up randomly. So I guess the, I think I've one of the, one of the hundred percent me bit pamphlets I had was, was saying that you could, um, report anonymously. Yeah. Cause obviously it's different, different to reporting to your coach. Um, but yeah, then they could just come in and say, oh, we're randomly choosing people, which yeah. would be a good way to do it. It's very, it's a difficult thing to do to, uh, to go for a wee, uh, while someone watches you. Um, Horrible. But at the same time, <laughs> every time I did it, I was still like, I'm really glad that they're doing it. Like, I'm, like, it's really a good thing to be a part of. And, and I would be really curious about how you felt because every time I did it and I got tested a, a reasonable number of times over the 21 years, I was always worried I'd made a mistake. Yeah. Right. So you're yeah. like, you're like, uh, you know, like, what have I done wrong? Like, what could I possibly be? There's that section on the form where they say, like, you can write down anything. So I'm just writing down every <laughs> supplement I've ever taken in my life. Vitamin C. 16 so, years ago. Sainsbury's, <laughs> Sainsbury's multivitamin tablet. Cause you're just, cause you're told, like, as long as you sort of mention it, should, should that give you a false positive? You know, you can kind of get pulled back on it. But, um, yeah, no, the, f- <laughs> the first one I did, I was at final trials in Hazelwinkle in, uh, 2008 and my pair's partner had um um had got injured about a week before so i'd gone very late into the single i'd come absolutely wow. dead last in the time trial and then got selected for <laughs> for anti-doping so i was so in i actually said to the guy on the landing stage i think i was like what well, whatever i'm taking it's not working is it <laughs> it's like all, all like absolutely livid with myself but oh. i'm a bad performance but no and it, um yeah it's a yeah, it's a weird one where you're, where you, you just start to feel really guilty. Like, oh my God, what if I've done wrong? And, mm. and then you think, do I look guilty? Now, and now they're thinking that I look like I shouldn't. And then you just, yeah, it's a weird, it's a weird one. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's difficult. It's, yeah. And of course, you know, for the, for anyone listening to it, think, well, it's easy to be clean. You just be, make sure you don't take anything that's on the banned list. But I think the fear is, and we talked about it earlier, you know, contamination mm. and, and anything that you, possibly could have had when i was chef de mission of team england for the youth common olympic games in in china we there'd been a whole load of worry about um in the Mm -hmm. food system Mm -hmm. so i basically had my athletes not eat so anyone who wants to eat fine in in the olympic village but outside the olympic village please be cooked and vegetarian because i wanted their starch to be okay and i wanted them not to have meat Anyway, one poor Kathy came back and they're like, it's okay, so like, I had McDonald's. And they went, which bit of the cooked and vegetarian McDonald's was it? <laughs> <laughs> um, it, 
it was the Big Mac. <laughs> and I was like, right, okay, I'm sure it'll be fine, one will be fine. <laughs> Because there was a bit of a scandal with that with meat in uh, in um, Tour de France, wasn't there? Albert uh, Contador um, got a positive test and claimed it was it was from the meat, and then and because the, then now you're like, oh god, now I need to worry about the meat. I mean, like, spot on, spot on. And it, and you know, we know that there's contaminants in water. We know there's contaminants in some foodstuffs, and I think you have to have an awful lot to yeah, test positive. But it, and especially if you're getting food in the uk which yeah. has different food standards but this is the thing like like you're saying someone will listen and say oh it's easy to be clean just don't take anything have you ever forgot a water bottle and taken a drink out of your mates yeah. yeah like yeah. this is little Spot things on. like that oh and um at one point when uh we sort of found about how um bicarbonate soda was like a lactate bo- blocker um but it's quite hard to drink bicarbonate soda so people would put it in in like the gel capsules so I bought some gel capsules just online and uh, I'd made them all up. And it was my dad, actually. I think he was visiting and he was like, well, where did you get them? And I was like, oh, yeah, I don't yeah. know. Like, Welcome, I, dad. Yeah. I have no idea what these are made of. I can't yeah. use them. And then yeah, it sort of, sort of snowballs, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, I wanted to segue a little bit into the boat race. With yeah, whole, and Sorry, we've been talking. Oh, no. No, no. Uh, so this, this actually segues perfectly. I wanted to talk about, obviously, as a student, you can't cook up a rotisserie chicken every morning and <laughs> put it in your bag. We've seen when we were coaching some students, we've seen some absolute poor diet decisions like mm-hmm. meal deals and sandwiches for dinners and, and things like that. Tom's rightly had a go at the students for doing that. But for a 16 minute race, exhausting especially with also having the university and a full-time training program, possibly not having the access to, to a sh- private chef. What is your take on supplementation for, for a race like that? Obviously, like, you want to maximize performance. Are there any, like, what, what are the steps that you would recommend taking? Yeah, that's really, really hard, isn't it? Because you're training away from your home. you have out for long days. You've got loads of, of miles. So, yeah, if I wear my UCAD hat, food first. Um, but actually, we need to be practical, don't we, and understand what people need. So, batch tested supplements um, can be can be really really helpful and get good food in as quickly as possible. I look back to myself as a row, and what I ate was not great. I yeah. eat better now. It's really really interesting because I've got a bit more time, I've got a bit more money, and I've got a bit more energy. Mm. Um, and yeah, you know, those poor food decisions happen not because. You know, it's just somebody hasn't, hasn't planned that as part of their day. So I'd absolutely, I, I, at the end, and I didn't always make the right choices, but I would look at my training program and my second thought would be, what food do I need when? And I would try and start to put things in places and there are better food choices you can, you can make. And I think there's a lot of, lot now that you can learn about nuts, seeds, beans, pulses, foods, you know, good foods that you, you can get easily that'll supplement your, your meal deal cheaply yeah yeah it definitely feels a bit easier to get healthy food these days than than 10 15 years ago for sure yeah yeah and um, meal prepping <laughs> yeah yeah, it. yeah that's the new thing isn't it um cool yeah so as we're on the boat race i guess we've got to talk about umpiring um again like did you want to get into umpiring or was it again something you just kind of got pushed into i definitely got asked into this but i'm bull and told this one so I wasn't an umpire and I retired. I, I wanted to stay fit and active. So I wanted to be part of my sport. And I did a little bit of coaching the first year and I loved it, but I realized you spent as much time not training in a, as a, you know, on the water or supporting people when you're coaching. Mm. So I was again just trying this, this balance of what life looked like beyond, um, my rowing career. And then, there was a decision that the women were going to go to the tideway. I'd been, I'd heard about it. I'd actually was president in 97. We had our race here at Henley. And at the time there was a conversation about whether the women should go to the tideway, but it in, came with, in 97. In 1997, it came with no money. Yeah. It came with no training at the time. The men would close the doors of Goldie Boathouse in our faces and not allow us in to uh, use their equipment so and that was the lived experience that we had so I I, I as president in, in conversation with others I, I thought it was best that we stay queens of our own castle here than be princesses in the the men's boat race who's mm. with no no support and no funding maybe there was an honesty about me and my my rowing at the time six minutes was absolutely enough <laughs> I was quite a novice and I was moving from a discus thrower 
But it, I mean, for me to see it finally go to the tideway was really, really exciting. And I, I feel slightly, I, you know, you wonder what different conversations, whether that mm. could, could have happened to me. And the Helena Morrissey made such a difference because she was, um, neutral asset management and she made sure that if it went, if the women went, they went with equal funding than the men. So it actually yeah. gave them enough to be able yeah. to, to do the same training, be able to be there and then, in the response, both Oxford and then much later Cambridge, we we have both managed to put boat houses for, so that so athletes can train mm-hmm. train well from from those setups. So my journey was that they knew the women were going. They thought they needed um, a woman to umpire, and I had a couple of conversations, and I was in that. Oh my goodness, I really can't do anything else. So I said no, uh, first and foremost. And then I walked away and there was this kind of feeling in my heart. And I was going, did you just say no because you were scared? Or did you say no because genuinely you're busy and it's not a sensible thing to add to your already heaving workload? Um, and it was, it was because I was scared. So I kind of picked up ha- humble pie and spoke to Anna Marie Phelps, actually, who was the, the lady who had first sounded me out about. And I was like, have you found someone else yet? Right, nope. No, like, okay, what do you think it takes? What do you think it takes to be a really good boat race umpire? And we had a conversation around that. And then what was amazing was the men who were already boat race umpires had massive amount of experience, both from Oxford and Cambridge. But let us, myself, Judith Packer, come in and we shadowed, we asked questions, we learnt. Judith was already a uh, British rowing and, and six lane multi umpire, but I did my British rowing, um, uh, umpiring training, um, alongside. So I understood what a British rowing umpire needed to do. And then, of course, we started to take some races on the tideway and that was, um, really exciting. And yes, it was bloody scary. <laughs> I was right. I was scared. I love that. I love that question. Am I, uh, have I made a decision because I'm scared or because I can't have time for it? I think that's awesome. I love that you went back and like faced that's it. That's the second thing. <laughs> Secondly, to be able to admit that you're wrong. People mm-hmm. are, this seems to be a forgotten skill that we, we can't ever, no one wants, no one, people are happier to sort of cut their nose off to spite their face. I am wrong all the time. Yeah. Um, we all are. We all are. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. Uh, and then number three, like, um, I love that you went there and it's like, well, what does it, not like, well, what do I have to do to get this over the line? It was like, well, what do I have to do to be really good at this? Mm. I love that question as well. Um, and I, I guess from shadowing them, what, what did you, what did you find? What, what was sort of, what didn't you think would be a part of it? And oh, was it, easier? it was just amazing. So the, interestingly, because a lot of the guys had raced the, the Putney to Mortlake course as, as athletes, but all as athletes, they'd all done it backwards. And actually mm. as an, um, because I'd done it, um, in the heads. You, you, as an umpire, what you see is actually what you see as a row when you're going the the other way, which is quite. So they spent hours and hours out in boats on the tideway, but actually the cox was making the decision. So mm. I found, the first thing that was really interesting because it actually felt quite familiar mm. when I started to to learn the course. At the time, Matt Pinson was brilliant, and he had a golf GPS, and we spent a lot of time. It was back in the day before GPS was everywhere, and. um it was back in the day before golf GPS was everywhere and we had this golf range find and we would check at certain points where we were and just double check we were, we were comfortable with the line. So loads of youth beginning to use technology around that. I love that. It was, yeah, really, really clever. And we were kind of mapping it and, 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 and just the way that, you know, Tony Reynolds, who became a boat race umpire, took me out one of my first races, Richard Phelps, Simon Harris, the men who had been part of that, John Garrett, all gave their time and their knowledge, and they all had different ways of doing it. Mm. And we were definitely there's only ten rules of the boat race. I mean, it's quite simple to learn. There's a few auxiliary rules beyond that, and about six of them say the umpire has the final say. So it's nice. <laughs> it's, it's on your shoulders, and you want to be my my view is out the way. If like, if you're mm. getting um, involved. I mean, Boris Rankoff was doing his final races and he was also now chairing that commission. So it's just, it was a lot of people who gave their knowledge. I learned, I asked, I was probably a pain because I asked lots of questions and I'll be watching and you'd be thinking, right, where, where's the course? Where's the foul? If I had to warn, who'd I warn? And then you'd see the umpire do it and you just learn 
different umpires' tolerances. It's really interesting how how they they work. And then I would then stop the boat race umpiring, and I still do. So about the boat race umpiring will finish in ten days' time. I'll then start doing some British rowing or some different British rowing umpire with a flag because I've been doing the head races over the winter. And you're going, okay, now someone's giving me a course. That's interesting. I, I've got boys. I know exactly where it is. And that feels very different. And then I, I'm very lucky now. I, I, I umpire at Henley as well. And they're two solid sides. Yeah. Uh, you know, you think, well, we know where the course is here, don't we? So <laughs> it's fascinating. So you move from this massive river on the tideway to... It's a massive river, you say, but the races are very, very close. Even last year, we've seen some manoeuvres from the Coxes where they were almost overlapping or, or kind of gauging very, very close on like possibly breaching the rules. H- how do you approach that as an umpire when you see something like that, the close it's, contact? It's really challenging. So the boat race arm only has 10, uh, 10 rules and there's one that you might disqualify a crew without a foul but most of them are there's no interference that you have in british rowing so you can't washing people down uh, technically is allowed under the rules mm. although we'd like someone to be further mm. away and um, so you are you're likely to only be making decisions around disqualification if they hit boats people or 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 us and when it gets close yeah you're what it, it you're watching really really carefully and just making sure that you're sort of in the where they are and but out enough so that you can see where they are on the river as well because you've got to be really clear in your mind whose water it is because last year you saw both uh both cambridge crews came over early and both Spot oxford on. crews went for the almost must have gone for the for the touch but didn't quite get it Spot on. um is that like scary to think that I might have to disqualify some, someone? Because presumably the disqualification would still come at the end of the race. Or would well, you, just you say can like, make a choice. You, you can could make be a like, choice. that's it. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, you can make a choice. You could disqualify it there yeah. and stop the race. Or you could let the race run yeah. and put a red flag up at the end and yeah, make yeah. a decision whether that had made a difference. Yeah. And then what's worse? <laughs> yeah, well, I you think could... I'd have to wait. <laughs> the minute you disqualify during the race, turn your phone off. Right, back in a week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bye. <laughs> yeah, I might not be going to the dinner. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but it is it. I mean, you have to be prepared yeah. to, to disqualify your own alumni and, of course, the other alumni. You have to be prepared to, you know, make sure that it, that it is a fair race yeah. and, the rules were very, very clear. All, every boat race umpire, and I'm umpiring the lightweight women this year, we will meet with those crews in the week before. We've met with them a few times in fixtures, but we'll go through and we'll go through the, the rules again and just remind them what they are. Yeah. And we want to give them the best chance of their best rowing. I feel like if I was Paddy or Rob this year, I'd be like, guys, not that close. Please. Yeah. Like, <laughs> please, not that close. Um, I wanted to ask, so how... Do how do you find the middle line? Like, what is the middle line? Is it subjective, or is it? Are you using like a like a impeller or something? No. So Matt's GPS will tell you we're pretty consistent around where we think it is. We use sometimes you'll see the umpires a lot. So we have really experienced drivers as well. So often, if I'm working with a driver, I'll t- and they know the tie way really well. I'll t- ask them to put them where they think the, the the middle line is. But often we follow the race. So where we're seeing so you have to be be aware of where you are we've got some sort of he- points in the distance that you also use which you will have used as a rower to row it we also use them to umpire so right where are we pointing and i will be very clear with my drivers if i ask them to move off the line to follow the race i'll know which way i've asked them ask them to move yeah yeah um and another question I wanted to ask. So last year we saw the men's race. We saw Cambridge men almost use that full and flat area. Oh, yes. Had some discussion afterwards about people talking about um, because that wall got rebuilt, the area was dredged. Yeah. So it therefore wasn't maybe as shallow as it might have been previously. Uh, so they sort of used that to their advantage. What, what, what did you think about that kind of thing? I was really interested because I think that was Jasper Paris who made that. And it yeah. wasn't, didn't come from the coaches that I understand. No. It was his, he's a St. Paul's, was yeah, it? Yeah, at, yeah. He knew the, oh, yeah, yeah. the tide way very well and he, he made that call. Um, well, it's famous, isn't it? He, yeah, yeah. he got an advantage for doing it. I did a fixture this week. Um, so I umpired the Ops Osiris against Leander actually uh-huh. on 
Saturday, I think it was. And it's really interesting conditions out there at the yeah. moment because there's very little um, stream. Okay. So it is the river, because we've got so much water coming down from this side of the river, when the sea comes up and, and it, it floods in, it's really still. So we've got um, a really, really interesting space. So when I've got the marshalling um, by the railway bridge, usually you're sort of trying to look around for what you know what's moving where's new it, it's and still not. yeah and they're, they're, and they're literally having to row towards the start rather than drifting as they would usually do so what we're gonna see and nobody really knows actually what what is faster so i think we'll see people using the apex is and so being you know cut, moving across and you'll probably see the middlesex crew deciding how far over they go in that first piece and then the Surrey crew obviously beyond on the Surrey bend will will just de- decide how how close close <laughs> they go yeah, and I, I think if, if conditions stay the same I mean the other bit that was interesting last year was just so rough in the middle yeah, yeah. and so what Jasper was getting was advantage he, uh, he was getting with the disutility or disadvantage of the rough water uh, in the fastest piece I've personally, I feel like Oxford made the mistake by following them as well, because then you, but then I guess you sort of, if you go with someone, you can kind of get the same advantage. If you don't, you potentially could lose or gain. I don't know. It's It's so hard, isn't it? I mean, I raced in the vets the day before um, and it was rough and hard. And I remember we came off the start and I hit a wave and I thought I've hit a blade. It felt, it was so solid. It felt like a blade clash. And I was like, oh, well, I didn't realize it was that close. And of course it wasn't. It was just a wave. And, you, you know, how much does that slow the boat down? Because we know the water's fast, but actually whacking a, something that feels like it's solid, mm. it can't, can't help, can it? So it, it's a judgment call. That's why we love that race. We can, we're going to be talking about that for years. Yeah. I've seen over the races, I've umpired, you know, advantages being, in rough, rough water, when Cambridge were behind and they went right, they were on the Middlesex crew and they went right into the Surrey Bend. I wasn't umpiring. I think Rob Clegg was umpiring, but I was the assistant. And so you suddenly got your crews switched. Yeah. And your switching crew, the one that's inside, is is catching up because the water's better. Yeah. Um, so you, it's match racing. You don't need to be in the best water. Yeah. You just need to be in better water. Yeah, yeah, and it reminds me. We spoke to Morgan Brian Williams about her race uh, when they they did the old true blue head for the head for the wall, head for the shelter. Um, but that was also crazy as well because then Cambridge sank but didn't sink. Yeah, because the pumps were so good they they pulled it back out of the water, which is extraordinary. Yeah, yeah. Now compared to to and yeah the, sinkings and things like that. The year the girls did did sink, I was at the start, so I was umpiring. I was due to umpire um, Isis Goldie. It was the first men's race that I, I'd umpired. And I'm standing there at Putney. It looks all pretty good, as it can look at Putney. And I'm hearing on the radio that the women are sinking under Barnes. And you're about to say go to these yeah. oh. two crews. And it was like, oh, my God, what are we about to face into? And it was re- I mean, it was rough. Yeah. And coming in and the pumps for the women on that occasion... Yeah. They didn't go go, but they yeah they were done, weren't they? I think that's what makes the boat race so exciting. Yeah, You've sure. got the same two crews racing every year, but they could be in a completely different formation. Like this year, we're going to have mostly novices race. Uh, next year is probably going to be a lot of Olympians. The conditions could be an absolute game changer every single time. Uh, you know, you could like 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 we're saying, you could have those close movements, uh, sort of crossing over and everything. Especially now, this year is going to be quite interesting in a women's race because of the streak that Cambridge has had over the last few years. I imagine Oxford are very, very hungry to make a difference, especially with their new coach, Alan. Yeah. Having seen and umpired the fixtures, what are your thoughts on, on the boat race? This yeah, year? it's great. And great question. So I, I am umpired by James. So I saw I send to Alan and met with Alan and Jane on Saturday. And Oxford look great. They look like they're well drilled. They're looking happy. They're communicating really well. So they're going to be a fast crew. I haven't been, I haven't umpired the, the women for Cambridge. So I can't tell you what I saw around there, but obviously I, I hear things and I think it's going to be a, a really good race. I think they're going to be some very good races. 
um, from what I hear on the grapevine, Oxford are, are the favourites. Um, but let, let's see. That's what we always it's talk about. similar. Yeah, uh, we always talk about it. If there's a, for example, five second difference over, over that distance, imagine what these crews would do matched racing 2k or the henley course as well I, I just wish there was like another week where we could just run that but on a 2k course and just course like not. really see how close those races could be i think that would be so so exciting and i guess we saw a little bit of that when i umpired the men's boat race at ely it was a straight course so it was a very different mm. experience um for them because you didn't have the bends or the decisions the cocktails were making different mm. different decisions um, and yeah that was pretty pretty tight um, and an interesting jump I thought, oh, this could be nice and easy. And then <laughs> actually I had a fair bit to do. Yeah, yeah. Cambridge um, threw their weight around on their own water a bit, maybe. Mm. Um, yeah, no, I think, I think uh, again, from what we've heard, people are saying, yeah, a close race. Although, I mean, I still think like, last year there was sort of, oh, you know, um, Cambridge women smashed Oxford again. And you're like, mm, over 18 minutes. I don't know what the finish was, 12, 14 seconds or something like that. If you break that down to a percentage, it's really, really small. Um, so I think it's, I think it's a lot more competitive than sometimes it can show. Uh, ultimately, with the way the race is run, you, you keep in contact until you can't. And if that means that the finish gap is, is bigger, Spot on. it's, it's sort of irrelevant because you can't, you can't win if you can't stay in contact. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And if the crew, as we have seen, you know, Oxford last year, but, you know, athletes who have absolutely given their all mm. and they start to lose consciousness, mm. actually, which is what, they do push themselves. We've seen it happen here at Henley. Of course, you do see it on a 2000 meter red course, but we do see it more regularly on that, on that longer course. Um, you know, anything can happen in that last three minutes. Although we know from the stats that most of the crews that lead under Barnes will win, but there's always that chance, isn't there? And as an athlete, you fight for that chance. <laughs> yeah, I was going to, it's always fascinated with me as a, uh, I've always asked boat race when it, uh, boat race certainly if they've come from behind like what how were you able to ignore that like that looming statistic that everyone knows okay we've passed through Hammersmith second now we've passed through through Barnes second you know statistically we're not supposed to win this how do you get out of the back of your mind I guess you just you don't stick you, to the process yeah, exactly oh, well or you just dig and dig and dig deeper don't you that point because yeah. and maybe you know some where you've been on in boats. I mean, I've had races even over 2000 meters that I'm, and in my single actually at Heiser Winkle, I'm thinking of a particular one. And I was so far behind at a thousand meters. I had to double look to have a look at wow. whoever the person who was leading. And so I'm just like, okay, I'm not, you know, this is, it was a, a, a round of final trials. I was like, right, fine. I'm not going to win this, this heat. That's fine. Just got into my rhythm. And then, 250 meters later they appeared with a massive mushroom over their head having blown up and i went through them i i didn't i i was just getting in my rhythm and doing my thing yeah, yeah. and they had obviously overcooked it and that's what you just have to do though you have to trust the process i guess stick yeah, with yeah. the process yeah i think they're similar isn't it you know wh whatever the situation's in front of you you call it in your favor you know if they've if they're ahead of you they've gone out too hard uh, if yeah. they're behind you, you've had a great start. Like whatever it is, you just you yeah. turn it for yourself. Yeah, yeah. spot it. Yeah, I love that. And also in racing, sometimes trying to work as hard as you can isn't necessarily going to make the boat go as fast. Like what you're talking about there, even in your singles race, yeah. getting into that flow state where you're just not even thinking, you're just rowing your best, you're just in the zone. Because obviously, all those movements ingrained over all the strokes you've taken during training. It's muscle memory. So if you just trust that and you just get into that rhythm, you can sometimes do better than if you just in focus on trying your best all the time. No, I think that's a great, great call, isn't it? And relaxing, trusting the process and getting out your own way. Because when you relax, the big muscles start to work, not the little ones. Yeah. So we're just, so what we're talking about with the boat race is different to racing at Henley. Because in the boat race, if you break the crew, you're almost guaranteed to win versus with Henley the racing is a bit more exciting and like as someone who you assembled a team of commentators I think Martin Cross told us 
what are some of the most exciting comebacks that you've seen? Oh, amazing. So, yeah, I listened to the podcast of you guys with Martin. What an amazing story. Oh, and I was like, I got name checked. So thank you, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> we can come back that three. I was like, oh my goodness. Um, so that I'm just, um, sorting out the commentary team at the moment, which is amazing. I'm very, very fortunate of the quality and the work that those guys do. And we've created them. A, and they or they and have created an amazing product. I, I, I mean, one of the best races and I was fortunate enough to umpire it, um, was Martin, um, was Drysdale against Kettlebosch. And it was oh, that yeah. final. And we, you know, we were aware that Drysdale was going for his sick title. It was going to match, um, Sam's record. So that would have been amazing. And I, you get a piece of paper from Steve telling you which of the finals you're umpiring. And I got that one. So I was like, Oh my goodness, that would be amazing. And I said go and then just watched and Kettle just went off brilliantly, beautifully. You know, he was just, um, very, very calm flighting and you could see Drysdale working and working back to our piece of work. And it, he put a push in and a push in and a, I thought, like, oh, he's going to break him. Cause you know, who's this cattle wash at this point? Mm. We, we think, oh, I'm thinking. And, uh, Mahe did pushed again and pushed again and it made no difference, but was just staying with, staying with, staying in touch. And I was like, oh my God, what a shame. Kettle's actually going to win, which well done kettle, but you know, my entire, it wouldn't, this, this would have been amazing. So it, cause Mahe had thrown everything at it. And I saw Mahe do one more push. And I was like, okay, it went the progress board, but my God, where have you found that from? And then Kettle stopped. He literally thought like he hadn't got another stroke in him and Mahe won it. And we just crossed the finish line. And I was kind of like, what haven't you? And I'm watching Kettle to check. He's like, you know, okay. Um, but my God, that was, that was just to be able to see it and be that close to it. And, Mahe to be down the whole way up on the bank side. Um, and you could see he had given everything he had. Um, yeah, incredible, absolutely incredible. I loved watching that race. I <laughs> oh, honestly, no one, no one really thought that Mahe could, yeah. could be either overthrown in, in that manner. Like, cause he's always notorious for just coming in in the last minute, even in the Rio final, Spot what on. he's done against Damir. So. Henley just provides such great and last fireworks year, I of races. And hired um, Ollie Zeigler. And oh my God, you, people can be really tough on Ollie. Oh, he can't do rough water. Well, I might. He was a swimmer who became a rower and got really good really quickly. So yeah, yeah. he had a whole body of training that he wasn't yet ready for. Yeah. And when, you, when I saw him at Henley and heard him at Henley, he sounds different. From any other single sculler I've ever, ever umpired or been near. And it's just the power mm. that he's creating. It's just extraordinary. So it's a real, as you can tell, privilege. I mean, the amazing thing about Henley umpiring is you're so close to the crews and you can hear them. It feels like at some point you have to remind yourself you're working. You're like, oh, God, no, this is me. <laughs> yeah. It is, and it is, and then you know, commentary. The the pictures are phenomenal, and I you'll get my voice a couple of times, but actually, it's not my job to be talking about it because we've got a brilliant team, and um, so I'm just trying to help them be set up for success. If anyone's listening to this and is going to enter Henley this year, please, please, please fill in your biogs and put sensible stuff because <laughs> I get really cross. Uh, as we kind of get closer to to the Tuesday, and I'm reading that you're you're a um, a trainer of a I don't know grasshopper that's been in the past a grasshopper training as a hobby, um, but anyway, all of those things. But actually, telling us about who you are, and so we can tell your story, your club story. So it's really really important. Nothing about racing the crew with Donald Duck and Sonic the Hedgehog. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Exactly, Sonic the oh, Hedgehog. Yeah. Donald Duck, all of those, all the kangaroo tamer. I think we've had that one. I, I won't mention. Deleted. I know Pete knows what I'm talking about. I won't mention the guy I used to with who put in. Yeah, and his hobbies and interests was like we were. I think we were like under 23 worlds, so we're obviously like 21. And he's something about like looking after my 14 year old boy or something. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, oh my god! Like <laughs> I know, I know, awful. and it's so oh. tempting. I know it's yeah. tempting. <laughs> 
um, good. Yeah, it was interesting to listen to Martin about that and kind of thinking like how much of that work do you have to do and how much gets given to you? And it's like he said the same thing about 15% of people fill out their bio and that's it. And it's extraordinary. So we have a team, Kim and Matt, so Kim Bennett and Matt Bennett, who help us. And so what, what we do is we create a brain every evening um, for the next morning. And so what we're doing with the brain is we're amalgamating the information that the commentators have known, the information the crews have put in, the information the coaches have put in, what's happened the day before. It's printed out on a big A3 sheet, put in a plastic folder, and we make, basically have the race order coming through. So when the commentators come through, They've got data on the brain. They can come up. We've got the double decker at Henley, which is really great. And Kim and Matt are there and they can come up and they can do research and then bring other research down. The reason we, we're not online, we're actually at the bottom of the floating stand. So where the press are is where the commentary is. Mm-hmm. And we just can't yet trust the internet or the electricity there. So we, um, have, have it re- printed out in plastic folders but we keep the plastic folders we've been using them now for nearly 10 years yeah that, they'll be uh, worth looking back on that'll be <laughs> fun to look back on i've noticed in the last couple of years i've uh people coming to me a bit more now as a source of uh, uh knowledge because we fix so many rowing machines at so many different clubs and schools and colleges and stuff so yeah people if they're um ul uh, they were racing someone. He knew we fixed their eggs. So his message to me, well, how are they doing? Like, what are they? <laughs> someone what else. Scores? Did you look? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know that much. Uh, yeah, no, it's it's wild the amount of races there are and like the level. You know, having to know what's going on at Kingston Grammar School and and how the Swiss rowing team has been this year. Like that's crazy. Yeah, and it is. And I set the timetable for the commentators in the next weeks and months. Actually, so early. But we only get the races they're commentating on. So you get Tuesday's draw on Sunday and then you get Wednesday's draw at about nine o'clock, 10 o'clock on Tuesday. And I basically put it on, on a shared drive. And so people know what crews they're chasing, they're, they're umpiring on. And now we've got a, a crew system that all the umpire, all the commentators can look, look at. So they can also look at that data, but it's, you know, it's, quite complex and yeah, just trying to set people up for success is what keeps and i walk around henley with post-it notes on me because people are either <laughs> <laughs> saying this is wrong that's gone this piece got wrong and i'm like right i can fix that <laughs> and so i uh, yes yeah, so if you ever see me at henley i have about 16 post-it notes somewhere <laughs> on my person from people very variously phoning in and saying just to let you know that's not right okay thank you oh, and it is it. it's brilliant crowdsourcing God, that's yeah, incredible to do a bit of that and go walk around the boat tent um, I guess the other thing being, well, I was talking to someone else, I was talking to Susie the other day about the laughing at how many times have your parents asked you what time you're racing tomorrow? I don't know yet. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. But later. how can you not know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, we don't know until, well, and then racing goes on until like 7, 7.30. So yeah, sometimes mm. it's like 9 p.m. So I guess you guys are working late every night. Yeah. So well, my Henley at the moment, or what I have been doing is an hour and a half before first race, sort of briefing the press with the one to watch. So I've been mm-hmm. doing that for a few years. And what I want to try and do that is go think, look at the, the timetable and say, what are they going to be the close races? What are they interested? What are the mm-hmm. stories for them? An hour before first race, I meet with the umpires and we divvy out the races. We get the races that we're going to race that day. So we do that from different boats. And then Steve comes along and we have... And he lets us know what guests and other people we need to have on the boats. So that happens. And then we start umpiring or commentating from, from nine o'clock. And then race finishes about seven thirty. We drop the timetable, um, deciding about eight, eight thirty. And then Kim, Matt, myself and a few others will be starting filling that brain, um, for the next, um, morning. Like the, um, the rowers thing they've got it hard <laughs> another <laughs> six minute race once a day i'm really grateful for all the work that you guys are putting into to make henley so incredibly exciting to watch the first ever campaign i did was in 2015 when the racing just got first televised and yeah i think you might have commented to one of my first races or something like that and there was oh gosh I, i'm sorry no. <laughs> I, say, no. I, was so, I mean we were obviously at the beginning it was so hard to get no, data that- that was that was great and then also uh yeah my first race was like very very late in the evening like seven or or or, or something like that so no it's henley's become such a great watch like show because of that and also 
just the fact that you can rewatch the races and then get excited and create so much hype around the event. Just even sitting here, listening to your prolific voice, you know, obviously talking about racing is just getting me excited about the summer season. It, it, the build That's starts great. for Henley in 10 days' time. Yeah. So with the water we've got here, you think, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? But we have to. We, we've got no more um, time to wait. So we start building in 10 days' time and we'll do what we can first. I so guess that was, it's... Uh, that was um, when we trained down here at Leander. We walked down to... Or walk or cycle down to training and just one morning around March or April, the lorries full of the booms would be parked outside and you're like it's happening it's yeah happening. it's definitely happening and then getting ready for all the photos people asking is it henley yet is it henley yet <laughs> <laughs> it's just amazing isn't it though because if you're local and i live in maidenhead but i come over henley bridge there's something that lifts in your soul when you see the tents come up and those uh, white and blue stripes being put onto that field it's just so, so, so exciting. It's exciting for the town, I hope. It's ex- certainly exciting for the rowers. And I think what's really exciting is we are looking to try and shift the people who had the opportunity to race at Henley. We're very, very clear we want it to be elite, but we want to have the best of different demographics, different mm. groups. So men, women, boys, girls are, are now able to race at the regatta and we're We've got six days and we seem to have filled them really, really quickly, which yeah. is an amazing opportunity. But it's also a problem when you, you're you trying to move it towards parity. Yeah, it's been great. Yeah, yeah uh, the event is, is growing stronger and stronger. And with that, Sarah, it's been so great talking to you today. Um, thank you so much for coming down. It's been it's been fantastic listening to the work that you've done as the Athletes Commissioner. Uh, as the chairman, uh, to hear about the boat race, your thoughts, getting us excited for Henley. I think it will be awesome to have you on again at some point and talk about your rowing background in, in detail because I think you've got an incredible story to share as well that people could learn a lot from and draw inspiration. So thank you. Well, I'd love to do that. Thank you very much. Yeah, I know. We definitely love to have that. There's, there's two world championship golds and three Olympics we haven't talked about. So <laughs> we're going to, we're going to have to come back and do that. But no, it's amazing. Yeah. Really exciting. I'm super excited both for the boat race and, and for, for this summer. So, um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for coming and talk to us. Hopefully we can do it again sometime. Thank yeah. you. That concludes everything for this episode. So on that note, easy there. Cue the music.